Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, all eyes on Wall Street as the stock market takes a plunge today. Also tonight, what business leaders hope to see from the upcoming legislative session. And we'll hear about improvements underway at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A rough start to the new year on Wall Street as stocks took a hit on this first day of trading. The Dow was down 276 points after rallying from a 470 point drop earlier in the day. Here with analysis is Wayne Stutzer, Senior Vice President at RBC Wealth Management. Good to see you again. Thank you. Thanks for coming on here. What happened today? Well, I mean, you know, once the ball starts rolling downhill, it seems like it just picks up momentum, momentum, momentum. But as you said, at the end of the day, in the last couple hours, that animal spirit came back into play here and it looked like people were still, there's a lot of money sitting around. And so when they saw things on what they thought were bargain prices, they, they started to snap it up. You know, late last night, uh, I checked the news before going to bed and everything, and I'm seeing headlines, China markets in, in free fall, something I'm thinking, you know, when that happens, usually the next morning, something bad happens on Wall Street. Something bad happened on Wall Street this it morning. It did. It rippled right through from the Asian markets, which were down, as you said, the Chinese market down 7%. In fact, they halted trading. We can halt trading, too, in this country, but the market has to drop more than 10% before we'd see a pause in the action, so to speak. And then in Europe, it was down 3%, and we were down the less of all, the you know, least of the worst, of, like about 2%. Two things in China. One, they had economic numbers came out on their manufacturing sector. The Chinese manufacturing sector has slowed down significantly, and that's the big worry. How much further can it slow down? But China, several years ago, now over two years ago, announced that they were trying to re-engineer their economy from what was called a demand economy, basically build it and they shall come, <laughs> and sell everything as cheap as possible to a more balanced economy like the United States has, more services, more consumer spending. And that transition is still being played out. But because of that transition, all the commodities that they were soaking up, for an example, half the copper in the world was being sold to China over the past decade. Mm. Iron ore, steel, oil, all those commodities were you know, being used by the Chinese to a great extent, and they don't need as much of them anymore. And that sent ripples across the market too. But secondly, Ted, um, the currency fell. And that story didn't get a lot of play. Everybody's worrying about the Chinese devaluing their currency. Uh, they just got voted in to being part of the club, let's say, of the major currencies of the world. And uh, they made a major move to drop their currency over, the, over this holiday. And that actually was a bigger story that didn't get covered. Well, what about the idea of us deciding we're going to raise interest rates and making things a little more attractive here at the same time they're devaluating there? That's correct. And the Europeans obviously saw the same thing, though the euro did go up today. So the, the central banks of the world are not all on the same page. We are the first to start to raise interest rates to get away from the zero depressionary policy that we've been in. The rest of the world is still in this policy that they started later to the game. We are the first to actually really take a strong effort to get this economy away from a depression. The Europeans were late to the table, so were the Japanese, so were the Chinese, and we're gonna be the first to lead the world back out of this zero rate policy. So, so if everything is devalued, if, if things are rough in China, uh, Europe's having its problems as well, and, and if, the Middle East, I'm sure what's happening with Saudi Arabia and what, uh, that whole situation has to have some effect. It had some effect, but it didn't have as much effect in oil that I thought. That was a story that I saw late at night and said, boy, oil's gonna have a big spike up, yes, but it didn't. It didn't. Now, maybe part of that is the fact that because of our, our ability now to utilize these shale rock formations, which just aren't in this country, they're all over the world, but we created the technology to, to lift this thing, uh, this, this oil out of these shale rocks at a cost-effective rate, maybe we won't have the type of spikes that we saw in the past with, with oil, which is a great thing for U.S. consumerism and for the world's consumerism. Okay, then explain please, if, if there's trouble around the world and the smart money wants to find a safe place, more than likely they're gonna look to us. That's good for us, yet the Chinese market goes down, Europe follows, drops, 
and our market hits 470 points to the bad until it rallies and gets back up to 276. Why, why, why are we affected you gotta this get way? The, well, the difference between traders and investors. So when the traders take over, because they can buy the same stuff back at virtually no cost tomorrow. So you, you're going to get these momentum swings, both on the downside and on the upside. They get either fearful or euphoric. And of course, fear, you, I can sell today, buy tomorrow. It's, it, you, I can, you know, that's an, unfortunately the name of the game. Does China know what it's doing when it comes to markets? You mean does it know what it's doing when it comes to all other markets? No, when it, just, when it comes to having its own stock market, when it comes to having its own version of Wall Street, when it comes to the free market, does China know what it's doing? It's learning. It's like, you know, did we know what we were doing in the 1920s? It's, a new, it's, it's new to them. So they're learning. They're learning on the go, so to speak, but they are learning. Uh, the caps that they put in, but last year, you know, that market went up what, 100% and then crashed all the way back down in a matter of six weeks. So I put that market very similar to the market that we saw in the, the roaring 20s. Mm. It'll take time. Uh, speaking of time, is this a one to two day hit or something that could be? I wish uh, I had a crystal ball. I know, but give me I, something here. I, I, what, I, what I do think is that the U.S. economy is still on good footing. Our manufacturing sector is slowed down too, but predominantly in the mining and, and the drilling sectors of it. The rest looks pretty good. Services look good. Gasoline prices are definitely a help to the economy. So as long as the economy continues to grow and move forward, it's, it's positive for the stock market over time. And that late rally was a, was a positive indicator. It well. was. We'll see how the market opens tomorrow. It's, it's, it's one day at a time. I, all right. <laughs> Except Wayne. if you're an investor. Then you can take a longer term perspective. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Good to have you here. Thanks Thank for you. joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. This week, we're hearing from a variety of leaders and advocates on their priorities for the upcoming legislative session, which begins next week. We start with the business community, and here with us is Glenn Hammer, President and CEO of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and Todd Sanders, President and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Happy New Year. Thank Good, you Happy us. New Year to you both as well. Uh, Glenn, your priorities for this next legislative session. Uh, is, w w what are you thinking here? Well, the, the, special, the special session that took place late in 2015 that referred uh, the education package that would inject $3.5 billion of new funding into our education system over the next 10 years, that was critically important, Ted. And, and probably the most important date this next legislative session will happen when voters go to the polls on May 17th. And it's critically important that voters pass Prop 123. And not just for our K through 12 education system, but for all of our budget priorities, including all of our tax competitiveness items. Uh, your thoughts on Prop 123? 
uh, we, we, we strongly support. It's vitally important. This is a brilliant uh, idea. We're, we're taking an underutilized asset in our state trust land. There's really no good sense in allowing it just to accumulate uh, dollars without directing them to, to kids in need today. And the beautiful thing about this, after 10 years, it'll have over $5 billion. And we're going to have schools with a lot more funding, which is why uh, really all of the major business and education groups support this. And, and kudos to Governor Ducey for working with state education leaders and our state legislative leaders for putting this uh, together. I know that uh, I'm sure the chamber supports as well, but you have been quoted as saying it's not a silver bullet. What did you mean by that? Well, I think it's kind of what Glenn talked about. So, you know, as we look at the economy, we've we've had a year now of our new economic development platform and, and what, it, what it's told us, what the data is telling us after talking to hundreds of business owners is that their, their biggest uh, priority right now is, is creating new jobs and hiring and what they're gonna need to do that is a qualified workforce. So um, this I think is the centerpiece of an overall strategy. I think the, I think the governor's talked about this. Um, clearly there's, there's uh, more we need to do in terms of the, uh, the JTED program, making sure that we have these, uh, the, the ability to have stackable credentials. Uh, the universities and community colleges are another really important part. And I know the governor's not le leaving that out. This is certainly just a, a way to do this in, a, in, a, in an organized fashion. I, I, but, but JTED seemed to be targeted. Certainly universities were targeted at $99 million in the last uh, budget and I think it's below what it was back even in 2008. We're still not even to that level. Um, what kind of message is that sending? Well, I think there was um, a fiscal, there was obviously a, a, a big problem on the fiscal side and we had to deal with that. So um, I think those that's in the rearview mirror as we look forward. Um, the message that we're sending to, to Republicans and to Democrats if, if you want to create jobs, if you want to grow the economy, this has got to be a big priority for you. And certainly to the voters, when we're talking to our members and to the voters, we're saying, look, Prop 123 is critical. Is that message getting through that you, you know, you're hearing from business, we can't find the right people, we can't attract diverse industry here or diverse business because of X, Y? Are, are, are lawmakers getting that message? Well, we, we have an excellent uh, university system and, and we have a great talent pipeline. The, the thing is, Ted, uh, we, we're in a battle with 49 other states and Arizona is, is a big state now. I mean, we just passed Massachusetts and you know, we're the 14th largest state in the country. That surprises a lot of people when they hear that. And, you know, we, we do need to do more to make sure that our university system has that they have the resources they need. We have some great private uh, university options. It's very exciting what Grand Canyon University has done and all the different credentials that the University of Phoenix offers. And we've got great technical schools and UTI. Uh, but, but we need to do more on education. And, and that's why you see in poll after poll, the issue that rises to the very top is, is improving our uh, continuing to improve our educational system. With that in mind, what do you want to see the legislature do? Well, I, I'd like to see them, uh, I, I like the uh, precedent that they sent last year. Short and sweet is nice. Uh, we, we'd like to see, I, I think as Todd was getting to, uh, there, there are some things that are very important that they do in terms of making sure that the funding formula works for career and technical education. Uh, we've got an excellent interim new superintendent at uh, Phoenix Union. And, and Chad Gesson, Dr. Chad Gesson. And when you take a look at some of the statistics of, of those career and technical education programs, they're cartoonishly good. 99% graduation rate, 80% uh, of those kids go on to a career or to, or, or to college. Uh, I think uh, of the kids in the program last, uh, last year or so, eight and a half million or $8.3 million of new scholarships. We need to make sure that we have uh, a, a, a properly funded CTE program. And we need to make sure that we're funding our, our, our top schools, particularly those schools that are serving uh, low-income Arizonans. Uh, well, and I'll say that you know, the, the nice thing about this is, is, is that the business community is willing to be a part of the solution. Part of what we're working on is taking cohorts of kids uh, through programs that will allow them to finish the 11th and 12th grade and go into a career and then using uh, the community college system, for instance, to, way to as a way to stack credentials and to really start to build a career. So I think we're, we want to meet the legislature halfway as far as the CTE funding is concerned and then be a partner to say, all right, how do we then take that and leverage that and put some of our own resources in to really enhance the economy. Uh, I, there's much talk about Arizona and, and Phoenix rebranding itself, getting a new brand out there, selling itself. 
Uh, what do you make of all that? It's interesting because as had, you know, we're, we're talking to so many businesses out there and really what their focus is, is how do I, how do I grow my business, how to create new jobs. But when I talk to people in other, other states, I, I talk about places like Banner's Alzheimer's Institute, probably one of the foremost research institutions in the world. Probably, most likely, a cure for Alzheimer's is going to come out of, out of Arizona. And that's the kind of, that, those are the kind of stories that we want to talk about. You're going to be talking to Bob Meyer in a few minutes, talking about some of the, well, an incredible uh, uh, project that they're working on. These are the kind of stories that, that we want to focus on. Yeah, and I can understand why you would want to focus on those. And yet, Phoenix Business Journal had a story not too long ago about a couple of industries, a couple of companies that were looking to move out here, and they saw the education reputation, and they saw, you know, immigration problems and the fact that maybe attracting a diverse workforce. And they said, this is the Phoenix Business Journal story here, Glenn. Now, this ha it, it, it has to happen. Yeah. How do you keep that from happening? Well, when you take a look at, I'll, t I'll tell you, again, when you take a look at the fact that the population trends, 14th largest state, Forbes has as the, the top state in terms of job growth, you take a look at what we've done in terms of the, we have, a, we have a terrific workforce, it's a diverse workforce, and you take a look at all the things that we're doing in terms of now improving our trading relationship with, with Mexico, the leadership that uh, Governor Ducey has taken, David Farker, the head of the Arizona-Mexico Commission, and our uh, mayor of Phoenix, uh, Greg Stanton, all the great work that he's doing. And we're seeing that uh, translate into new, 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 new jobs. Uh, we have great educational op options in the state. Do we need to do better? Absolutely. But I'll say, I'll, I'll close on this point on education. There's no state in the country, as far as we can tell, that has a plan to inject three and a half billion dollars of new dollars into its system over a 10-year period without raising taxes. And, and I'll tell you what, so Glenn and I talk to our colleagues around the country. This isn't an, an Arizona story. This is happening all, all around the country. Think about your, your, your smartphone. Uh, the one you buy today or got for Christmas, it, two years from now, it's going to be obsolete. So, so the, 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 the amount of knowledge and, the, and the, the amount of innovation that's happening out in, in industry is so quick that we're struggling. All states are struggling. All countries are struggling to keep up with demand. And yet, if I want to expand Ted's Hamburger Hamlet, you know, from wherever I came from to Arizona, I'm going to be looking at have, certain things and I'm going to be saying, well, what's going on Ted, here? have them call either Todd, Todd or myself. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll find him a good school. I mean, you take a look. We have two of the best charter school networks in the country in great hearts and basis. These are better schools than in Westchester, New York. We've talked about it. My kids get a better public school education than my sister's boys who go to public school in Chappaqua, New York, where the Clintons live. And yet, and yet, I'm seeing public funding and uh, investment in education at 40, 49, 48, 45, 50. All, all, I'm seeing the 40s and the 50s as far as education. I'm, sure, I'm going, we, what's we happening need, out we, there? We need more dollars, but it isn't simply dollars. And we'll be making a huge mistake if we, if we fall into that tra trap. Look at Detroit, look at New York City, look at Washington, D.C. Resources are part of it, no doubt about it, but we have to make sure that we're funding the school systems that, that work. And we've got uh, you know, great traditional public schools. I, I mentioned the, work, the great work that uh, Chad Gesson's doing at, mm -hmm. at Phoenix Union, Mesa Public Schools, Chandler, Gilbert, Scottsdale, and there's uh, uh, some, some terrific public schools in southern Arizona, Vail. And I told my members that the, when they ask us this question, look at the precedent, as Glenn said, that the legislature and the governor said just a month ago. And so we, we've got to continue that. And I think that's going to give business owners the, the confidence to come here, but also to expand their businesses. Uh, last question. As far as uh, I want to get small business, uh, that aspect in here, there, obviously there's a lot of concern for corporate tax credits and corporate tax breaks and these sorts. Is the little guy getting lost in all this? Just can the legislature pay more attention to the little guy? You know, I think that it's it's sometimes, uh, especially as the media looks at the legislature, they'll pick one or two things, and that'll be sort of the thing that they focus on. If you're down at the legislature, like Lynn and I are, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, there are hundreds of issues they're working on, and and they run the gamut, everything from uh, everything from education to to environmental law, and and. I can tell you because we have small business owners that are represented at the state legislature, and and certainly they have their champions at the state legislature. The the small business community here is very well represented by by the chambers, by NFIB. Uh, they're doing, in my opinion, v very well. We ha we've been operating under a regulatory moratorium, uh, and and we know that regulations tend to hurt the smaller guy a lot bigger than the larger businesses. 
and on, on the tax front. All the different things we've worked on on the tax side really apply across the board. So, uh, you know, more, more work to be done to be sure, but, but we are always concerned about uh, making sure that, that our policies benefit all businesses of any size. Good to have you both here. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Phoenix Children's Hospital is undergoing an expansion involving a new emergency room and trauma center. Joining us now is the hospital's president and CEO, Bob Meyer. Welcome back. Good to see you. Yep. Uh, what's going on? Is this an expanded ER and trauma center, a whole new facility? What's going on here? Uh, well, I'd say it's both. I mean, obviously, we have an uh, emergency room and a trauma center today that's in our east building, the older of our two buildings. And it was built initially for 25,000 visits a year. We're seeing about 90,000 emergency room visits a year in that space, so it's obviously very cramped, uh, et cetera. So it's a complete replacement of current, new uh, space. And this will improve care, I would imagine, in a variety of ways. Uh, uh, give us an example of how it was before and what it's going to be. Well, it's a good example. I mean, a, a lot of things that need to be next to one another, adjacent, like our radiology imaging department, today is a long way away. So we have multiple imaging departments. Uh, the uh, helicopter pads are too far away today. Mm. All of this gets consolidated into what would be a, a traditional and uh, the kind of design you want. So again, imaging and the ED trauma center back one another. Uh, helicopters land on the roof. The elevators take them directly into the resuscitation rooms. It'll be a much more improved. And you mentioned the facility now handles what, 20, some, 22,000, something well, like that? It was that? originally built. And you now the original building, the East, what we call the East Building, uh, is a very old building. It was built in the late 60s, and it was built to be a community hospital. So the ED was actually sized for about 25,000 patients a year. We're seeing 90,000. My goodness. And so we've uh, run out of tricks. We can't put any more children through this. Uh, so our, we made a decision, and the, the board agreed to replace it completely. And this is a, a children's only emergency room, right? And yes. a tr level one trauma center. Yeah, level one trauma center. It's the only level one pediatric trauma center in the state uh, that's certified by the American College of uh, Surgeons. Uh, which may, and there's a, there's some subtle difference between adult and pediatric, mm -hmm. but most of all, the outcomes, the actual care of the children, the outcomes are better in a pediatric trauma center than children treated in an adult trauma center. So have we broken ground yet? Yeah, we just we just broke. We had our little ceremony to toss the dirt around, uh, but they're demolishing things and so forth. And this is all land that we had purchased. It was, uh, the architects refer to it as an empty chair. So again, it's a four-story addition to the west of the uh, new hospital. And actually, we'll also be uh, expanding our ambulatory clinics with new hematology oncology clinics. Uh, surgery clinics, uh, also replacing our laboratory. Uh, so again, a lot of things that were in that east building are now going into the new building, which is you know current technology. Timeline for being up and operational? Uh, 20 months. 20 months? Yep. All We've right. been fast-tracking this thing. All of the bidding, all the design, everything's already done. Now, don't you have like the ninth story uh, being built as well, an 11 story facility? What, what's going on with that? Yeah, we've, we've run out of capacity. Uh, multiple times since we even built the new tower. So we built out our ninth floor, which was shelled, which gives us 48 more private rooms. <clears throat> and so again, it's a, it's a continuing growth story, so to speak. Indeed, and uh, what, sixth, fifth, sixth largest uh, children's hospital in the U.S.? What, where, where when, are you? With the new 48 beds, we've just moved up to fourth. Moved up to fourth? Yeah. My goodness, so with all this going on, it sounds encouraging. What's your biggest challenge right now for the children's hospital? Well, I think it's a, it's a challenge everybody has right now. I mean, we're coming out of a very deep recession. Uh, the public payer 
for children is Medicaid or the state of Arizona. It's not Medicare, it's not the federal government per se. So we've been uh, having a lot of issues with Medicaid reimbursement. About 50% of children in the uh, state are on the Medicaid program. So about 50% of the children we treat are on Medicaid. So our biggest single challenge is that funding. Yeah. And uh, But the state works very closely with us and uh, we've made it all work through this recession. And we're looking at late next year, that new trauma center up and operational? Yes. Excellent. Good news, encouraging news. Good to have you here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm. And Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, an update on the expected impact of this winter's El Nino weather pattern. And we'll hear what education leaders want to see from the upcoming legislative session. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.